Well, it's true that there are things that are unchanging that we can fasten on, that we can hold on to, that we can cling to. If we live in a world where things are constantly changing, where there is a never-ending process of adaptation, of shifting, of movement, the topic I have tonight, the age of tolerance, is in some respects about changes, alterations in the way people view life, meaning, the world. The age of tolerance. In the ancient Roman Empire, in the days of Jesus, back in the first century, occupied a land mass in Europe and Asia and North Africa that today comprises more than 25 different nations with different languages, races, and customs. In the first century, the area of the empire encompassed even more different cultures than that same landmass today. The prior empires, including the Assyrian Empire and the Greek Empire, had tried to break down the cultures and the languages in some of those areas, had tried to cause the people to come together under the Assyrian culture, the Assyrian language, under the Greek culture and the Greek language. But Rome really didn't take that approach. Rome, to a great extent, chose to tolerate the diversity of the conquered peoples. Rome didn't try to impose its own culture, its own language on all those people, but embraced the Greek culture that already dominated a great deal of the empire that they conquered and that they ruled. They embraced that culture, they adapted in some respects their own religion to conform even more closely to Greek religion and Greek thought. So the people, by and large, kept their own languages, their own religion, their own marriage customs, and so forth, under the domination of the Roman Empire. It was an age of tolerance. However, Roman Empire's emperors, rather, Roman emperors did impose one thing on the people. The people they conquered as a unifying force, as a sign of loyalty and fidelity to the empire, the people were asked to offer sacrifice to the emperors. Now, to most of those people, in all those diverse cultures, that wasn't a very big deal. You offered sacrifices to so many different deities already. You had festivals with so many different mystical meanings already. What was one more sacrifice to one more nominal deity, the emperor claiming himself to be a divine being? Rome, in her tolerance, could swallow almost everything except monotheism. Rome could swallow monotheism. The Jews were a thorn in the side of the Roman Empire, and the Christians even more so, because they would not bow to the emperor. They would not show faith and fidelity. And not only that, they wouldn't adopt the hedonistic customs that prevail in the pagan world in which they live. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, the Apostle Peter talks about the contrast between the life of the typical Christian and the life of the typical pagan. He said in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. For the time already passed is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatry. In all this you are surprised, or they rather, in all this they are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excesses of dissipation, and they malign you. Now what's Peter saying? He says, this pagan world in which we live is full of excesses. People driven by their appetites, people driven by sensuality, with a never-ending appetite for more and more. And you did that before you were in Christ. But now you're in Christ and you don't run with that crowd anymore. You still know those people, but you don't do those things anymore. And they're mystified by the fact that you don't do what they do, and they malign you. They heap abuse on you, the NRV said. 
Why? Because you criticize them? No. Because you are intolerant of them? No. Because you are in their face about what they're doing? No. Because you don't do what they do. And that's not acceptable. Because the very fact that you do not join in, even tacit disapproval, is intolerable. You may live in an age of tolerance, but even tacit disapproval, even non-participation, is intolerable to those who are driven by their lusts and appetites and passions. It is not acceptable. Now there are a number, we live in a, if you haven't already figured out, we live in an age of tolerance. Pretty much anything goes. If you want to do it and it doesn't hurt someone else, whatever that means, then go ahead and do it. That's pretty much the philosophy of the age. There are no standards. There are no moral bylaws. There are no absolutes. Do what feels good to you, as long as you don't hurt someone else, again, whatever that may mean. There are a lot of hot-button topics with the kind of tolerance that is pervasive today. John has already talked about several of them. In fact, pretty much everything that I'm going to mention as a topic in our tolerant society is something that John has already touched on in his lessons this week. He's been doing introductory material for this particular lesson. He mentioned this story, and I'm going to mention it also. There's a story of a Colorado baker who got in trouble because he did not want to make a wedding cake for two men who wanted to celebrate their marriage. Two men were going to marry, and he said, I'm sorry, we can't make that cake for you. All right? There are other similar stories, other businesses that have similarly impacted a, a, a photographer, and yeah, there's, there's a number of similar stories like this. But this particular story, the, the version of it that I have comes from the uh, New York Daily News. New York Daily News. Jack Phillips would rather stop making cakes altogether than be forced to bake for an LGBT couple's wedding. LGBT, you know what that is, right? No. Oh, that's too bad. <laughs> Lesbian, gay, bisexual, transsexual, that is the shorthand for all of the safe sex and cross-sex and confused sex kind of uh, rights that we're talking about these days. The late with Colorado man's decision came after his state civil rights commission ruled that he had discriminated against newlyweds, David Mullins and Charlie Craig. Jack Phillips, owner of Masterpiece Cake Shop in Lakewood, was willing to go to court to defend his decision to refuse service to two grooms who walked into his, his shop last year looking for a way to celebrate their marriage. One of the reasons I read that sentence is because Obviously, the New York Daily News thinks he's the bad guy, and, and they're, they're not, because they're just looking for a way to celebrate their marriage. What's the big deal? But he declined to do business with them. And the story goes on. It says that his crusade, Philip's crusade, he declined to make a cake, but it's a crusade. Philip's crusade turned out to be a giant failure after the commission, the labor commission there, unanimously ruled that he had violated civil rights by discriminating against the couple. The story goes on to say the devout Christian is retaliating, that he is retaliating by refusing to make wedding cakes altogether. Now, I'm, I'm going to strike back at you. I will no longer make wedding cakes. That's retaliation. I, if you're not appreciating the bizarre language that's employed here, then you're really not thinking through the implication. The man is eliminating an aspect of his business because he does not want to support gay marriage. And that's a retaliation. He's striking out against these four people who simply wanted a wedding cake. The irony of the story goes on, and it's ironic to me at least, that gay marriage is not legal in Colorado. These men were not being married in Colorado, they were being married in Massachusetts and wanted to have a reception in Colorado. But even though same-sex marriage is not legal in Colorado. They still rule against him for discrimination by declining to make the wedding cake. And his solution to that is to no longer make wedding cakes. Now, I understand that kind of solution very well. We used to have a policy at the church in Bakersfield that if someone wanted to use the building for a wedding, there were certain things they had to do, particularly non-members. By and large, we didn't really want non-members to use the building for weddings with if they were willing to buy insurance, if they were willing to sit down for a series of six Bible studies about marriage, 
and uh, basic biblical principles, then, with some other criteria, they could rent the building for rent. They could use alcohol. There's a lot of, a lot of things on there to make it palatable. But about 10 years ago, I said to the elders, you know what? I don't think we can do this anymore. Because the way things are going, we're going to find ourselves having someone who wants to have a same-sex marriage or some other completely unacceptable situation, and we're going to be in a legal line. I think it's time for us to decide that outsiders simply can't use the building. And that was the decision that was made. It was, a, it was obvious to me that this kind of change was coming uh, quite some time ago. And we're not by any means done with it yet. So this gentleman, in the language that was employed to talk about the circumstances there, uh, part of his business is over. Same-sex relations, he said, you know, if they came to me and asked for a birthday cake, I'd make it. I don't care. But they came and asked for a wedding cake, and I can't support that. My conscience won't let me support that. And consequently, not only did he lose his case and uh, suffer fines and penalties, but for the next few months, he has to submit quarterly reports about who he refuses to serve, and he has to give his employees anti-discrimination training, and uh, so forth. Anyway. Um, second story on the same topic, hot-button topic, same section area. You know, California passed a law in 2000. It was struck down by the courts, saying marriage was between a man and a woman. In 2008, second time, California passed a law. This time it was an amendment to the California Constitution. Uh, I thought both of them were a bad idea, but that's a separate kind of, kind of story. Because when you put things on the books that allow the courts to interfere, the courts very often don't do what the people would do. And so sometimes it's just not a good idea to get into the arena in the first place. But nevertheless, 2008, Prop 8, California voters, 52% of the voters passed this amendment to the California Constitution. It took two years for it to be thrown out, but it was thrown out. And, uh, and so same-sex marriage was legalized by the courts in California, by the Federal Appeals Court, uh, ironically by a closet um, homosexual judge, but that's just part of the irony of the story. He wasn't influenced by his own preferences there. He said so. Um, but there's a, there's a company in California called Mozilla, and they, some of you may use the Firefox web browser, I do, or the Thunderbird uh, mail uh, software, I do. This company has, has been around for a number of years, and was founded by two people. One of the founders of Mozilla was uh, a man named Brandon Pike, who also was the, uh, the source of Java software and some other things. Mozilla announced Thursday afternoon, this is back in April, Mozilla announced Thursday afternoon that its newly appointed CEO, JavaScript creator, and Mozilla co-founder Brandon Ike, who stepped down after his appointment last month, sparked a firestorm of criticism for a $1,000 donation to the 2008 campaign for Proposition 8, California's ban on same-sex marriage that was eventually overturned by the courts. And it goes on to talk about the company attitude of Mozilla and the difficulty they had with uh, all of the uh, unhappiness that was involved in this. But, but, but here's a man who's a very successful entrepreneur, who's very successful in the software industry, who's very well known, who's been involved in founding multiple companies. And when he became CEO of a company that he co-founded, that was completely unacceptable. It's not the first time it was controversial, but it was just completely unacceptable. They, they suffered an inundation of intimidation by uh, internet uh, threats of uh, re repercussions against Mozilla. And so this man had to step down. He had to resign because six years ago, he donated $1,000 to the campaign for Proposition 8. Now, he's not the only one to experience that kind of, of, uh, of feedback from being involved in the politics of that situation. But uh, you, you can't, you see, the reason I bring that story up, both of those stories up, is that you, you just, we live in an age of tolerance unless you disagree. If you disagree, then tolerance no longer applies. You're not allowed to have a different opinion. You're not allowed to have a different viewpoint. Now, I have an article here called Right Wing Food Companies, and I, it might be amusing to read all of it, but I'm not going to read all of it. But the first company that's mentioned in the Right Wing Food Companies list is Chick-fil-A. You know the Chick-fil-A story, right? Their 
their CEO, was the CEO, anyway, their chief executive, whatever his title was, also is someone who has contributed to various funds that, uh, that agitate for the traditional family and against same-sex marriage and some other things. And so um, that had a big book we do a while back, and this article about right-wing food companies is basically saying that this is from a left-wing source versus a right-wing source. And I'm not, if, if I seem to be coming across as advocating conservative politics, that is utterly not my point, because politics are not my point. I'm just talking about a value shift that has occurred in perception that has occurred in our culture, and it's not about who you vote for, and it's not about whether you consider yourself conservative or liberal in terms of the political front. This particular news item is from a company, or from, a, from an author on a page that is very left-wing, very much left-wing. And so these are companies that he's advocating that you should boycott. These are right-wing companies that you should boycott. And my son Ben looked at the list and said, Carl's Jr., are you kidding? But that's, yeah. I don't know, if, uh, those of us from California know what Carl's Jr. advertising looks like. And are you kidding? Because uh, they tend to be pretty sleazy in their advertising. But, but their founder, Carl Karcher, was very much pro-life. And he donated a lot of money to pro-life causes, or as this says, anti-abortion causes. But uh, because he donated a lot of money to pro-life causes, you ought not to patronize Carl's Jr. This is, this is not good. Thing. But regarding Chick-fil-A, it won't be news to many readers that Chick-fil-A's owner is deeply entrenched in conservative politics and social issues. The chain has been in the news many times for its owner's anti-gay attitudes in particular. The latest Chick-fil-A hubbub has been especially high profile. Chain President Dan Cappy, who is the son of Chick-fil-A's founder, S. Truett Cappy, said in a recent interview with the Baptist Press that as an organization, we can operate on biblical principles. Asked about the company's support of the traditional family, quote, quote, traditional family, Kathy answered, well, guilty as charged, we are very much supportive of the family, the biblical definition of the family unit. We know that might, be, might not be popular with everyone, but thank the Lord we live in a country where we can share our values and operate on biblical principles. So what are they in favor of? Traditional family, family which would have hopefully a father and mother in the home with their children. All right? Now, he would be in favor of things like adoption. He would be in favor of things like people who lose a spouse, you know, taking care of. He would be in favor of all sorts of things that involve parents and children, but the traditional family, a biblical described family. And the response to that by this author is, though Chick-fil-A's attitudes were no secret, this was a bold statement. You support the traditional family? That's a bold statement that you support the traditional family. Under, unsurprisingly, a strong backlash led by gay rights supporters has uh, sued. So, um, yeah, these, these ideas, these things that deal with these hot button topics such as same sex relations, they spill over into other areas of our lives. The, the family is a target in ways that you may not appreciate. A number of years ago, you know, since we had so many books that pictured the traditional family, we had so many kids that were in non-traditional families, it became fashionably uh, acceptable to have books that had, you know, Johnny has two dads, or, or books of that sort. And now, in just a few years' time, we've come to the place where if you advocate as a better model, if you say the traditional family is better for the children, that's prejudice. That's contrary to the best interest of the culture. That's contrary to the best interest of all those people who have non-traditional families. You can't advocate for better or best because not everybody has that. So don't do that. That is considered a good to advocate for what has been considered normal for a very long time, or not only decades, but for millennia. And then we come to the Hobby Lobby front. Hobby what, what was the Hobby Lobby story about that? Well, it was about the Affordable Health Care Act, which mandates that employers provide contraception for their employees, and particularly that pertains to female employees. And as I understand it, there were 20 different contraceptive methods that had to be covered by those insurance plans under the Affordable Health Care Act, or Obamacare as it's called. 
And Hobby Lobby being run by some people who have a worldview that says um, we don't destroy life, they're not willing to be involved in abortion. Five of those methods they objected to. Out of 20, they objected to five of those methods, which they considered life-ending procedures. The morning after pill. They, they considered these to be abortifacient procedures. And so they said, we don't want to cover. We're willing to take the contraception, but not for those five. And they went to court, and the Supreme Court gave a very narrow decision. It was a 5-4, but that's not what I mean by narrow. I mean a very narrow decision in terms of those specific modes of contraception, saying that they had a legitimate right under their religious beliefs to refuse to supply those. That ignited a firestorm. If you don't, if you may or may not know what firestorm that ignited, but that ignited a firestorm of opposition from certain women's groups, certain groups that are uh, very strongly opposed to any sort of restraint whatsoever. Now, originally, nominally, it was about women's health issues, which is to say, some women need birth control pills for hormone issues, or, you know, there are various reasons that people use some of these kinds of drugs. Is uh, There are various health issues involved here. But when it came right down to it, and to discussion of it, um, this article was entitled, Hobby Lobby Opens a New Front in the War on Women. That probably is very popular in all of these kinds of, of topics. And it, and it discusses how contra contraception is a way of life, a fact of life for millions of women of reproductive age, 62% of whom are currently using a contraceptive method. More than 99% of women 15 to 44 who have had sex have at least have used at least one form of contraception, yet the Supreme Court's majority opinion focuses instead on the rights of corporations, etc., etc. But if you read this article or numerous other articles, which I was subjected to, and I'll tell you that story in a moment, um, what it really is about isn't health and safety per se. It's about the, the opportunity to have sex without consequences. That's really what the story is about. If you say that there are certain methods of contraception that are inappropriate, then you're interfering with the rights of a whole lot of people to have sex without consequences, as they think. There is no such thing as that. But that's the notion. That's the idea, is to be able to do what they want without repercussion. And the government, which is to say everyone, ought to pay for that in one way or another. Now, at the time when that decision was rendered and when it was a real hot-button topic just a few months ago, I had a cousin that I do not know on a face-to-face -face basis, but some of her siblings had found me in, on Facebook, and in fact, we knew each other on Facebook to some extent, so we only ever met once when I was a boy. And that was all fine, but this cousin, who's a, member, a younger member of that family, also uh, found me in. I was getting a constant barrage of, of uh, negative, very, very negative left-wing political propaganda from her. So I got in the habit where I just would click on it. I don't want to see more from this feed. I don't want to see anything. But when this particular decision came out, she just had a flurry of these War on Women posts that she put up. And it aggravated me to the point that I commented. Now, you can't do that. But I did. I commented. And I said there's an awful lot of hyperbole and misdirection in the post that you're sharing here. And if you think about it, this is not that big of a decision. It's not that big of a win for conservatives. It's not that big of a loss for liberals. It's not that big a deal. Well, her response was not kind. And I won't get into the specifics of what she said. But, but she did let me know that being a man, I had no idea. I had no idea what it was like to be a woman and to have these problems. And she iterated several problems there. And that my ignorance was appalling, and so on and so forth. And those were the kind words. And I replied that I, I really thought that there might be a more balanced approach. And I posted, I, I linked to an NPR article. They're not the most right wing people ever. I linked to an NPR article that dealt with the story and said, maybe you should read some other sources that aren't so negative and so fiery, and maybe you'd be a happier person. And I know this the next day. I noticed the next day there was nothing for her at our newsfeed, and sure enough, she was no longer my friend. I was deleted from her friend list. Now, I tried to do something that I really want to advocate in the course of this discussion. There in 1 Peter, when Peter said that we should 
not do what the pagans do. And we should expect that they will malign us if we don't do what they do. A little bit before that, Peter had said in the third chapter, in verses 14 and 15, even if you suffer for doing what's right, even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you're blessed. And do not fear their intimidation, and do not be troubled, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense, always being ready to give an answer, to make a defense, to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. I will not claim that I always do that with gentleness and reverence, but I think that's a really important part of living in an age of tolerance, which is not tolerant at all, with different viewpoints of contradiction or disagreement. But it's really important, as Peter says here, that we be ready to speak for what we believe, to give an answer for the hope that is in us, and that we do that with reverence and fear. And I try to do that. I have, there's, there's only one thing that has really cost me, if it's a cost, a number of Facebook friends, and that is these hot button topics. Uh, several years ago, there were several people, some of the people I could name and you would know, there were several people who unfriended me because of the discussion about same-sex marriage. And I really was not in any way being inappropriate in my comments and remarks. And I, I have no... I don't look back and say, well, I shouldn't have said that. I, I didn't say anything that was like too primitive or angry or anything of the sort in a discussion that was going on. But there are half a dozen people, most of them young, not all of them, who decided they didn't want me on their friend list anymore. And one of them later came back and re-added me, and that was fine. Uh, and he and I sometimes cross horns a little bit, but usually, usually respectfully and without... Uh, and he's, he's someone that I hope... Uh, will rediscover his Christian faith at some point in time. But be ready to give an answer because you're going to find yourself in conflict with people in this world because the values of the world are moving past and they're not moving in a biblical direction. They are not moving in a Christian direction at all. And so we have to be aware of that. I think we really need to be aware of that. But, but also to realize, and one of the reasons I started, I opened with the Roman Empire, is the fact that what we are becoming in terms of our value system is more and more like the world in which the church started. Was the church able to flourish in that environment? Yes, it did. Can the church flourish in the current prevailing moral environment? Yes, it can. But Paul and others who wrote the New Testament had to say to Christians, don't do what those guys are doing. Don't do what the people around you are doing. Behave differently. Be holy people. Be set apart to God. Don't follow the prevailing winds of pleasure pursuit that everyone else is engaged in. You've got to be different, and you've got to have a testimony for Christ in your heart and in your mouth. You've got to do that. But this is not a situation for defeat. Paul, when Nero is emperor, is telling us to have respect for government authorities. Peter, the same thing. At a time when the government is as bad as it can be. I mean, we don't have a Nero in the White House. You may not like the guy in the White House, but we don't have a Nero in the White House. And the government then was as bad as it could be, and they still said, respect the governing authorities, pay your taxes, be dutiful citizens, because you need services they provide. You need law enforcement. You need services that the government provides. And as a consequence, you have an obligation. God puts them in place, and you have an obligation. So always sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account, for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and respect. I'm not quite done with talk about the topics. I, I want to mention a couple more, and, and this has come up again in the classes that John's been talking about, in the area of science. In the area of science, I'm just going to mention a couple of characters here. One of them is Bill Nye. Bill Nye, the science guy, he, he had a, a pretty cute show on PBS which was sponsored by Disney. And I mentioned that to poison the well a little bit, which is a logical fallacy, but, but it was sponsored by Disney. The PBS show that Disney sponsored the real life. did science for young people, you know. And uh, it was a pretty popular show and pretty well done and pretty well received. But Bill Nye made the news a while back, two years ago actually, time flies as you get older. 
And Bill Nye said, and he made a video, not only did he say these things in an interview, but he said these things in a video, which you can watch on YouTube if you want to, but I don't really recommend it. I say to the grown-ups, if you want to deny evolution and live in your world, that's completely inconsistent with everything we've observed in the universe, that's fine. You live in a world because you believe in creation that's completely inconsistent with everything we've observed in the universe? Well, I think you do. If you believe in creation, you are out of touch with reality. And he thinks that's okay for grown-ups. But don't tell that stuff to your kids, he says. Okay? Don't make your kids do that, said Nye. Best known as host of that educational TV series. When you have a portion of the population that doesn't believe in evolution, it holds everyone back. Really? Really? How many of the guys that put people on the moon believe in evolution? I don't know the percentage. But I do know that the astronaut that stepped out on the moon not only believed in God, but I've read lately that he actually took along communion wafers because he wanted to somehow honor God when he was there on the surface of the moon. Now, that wouldn't occur to me, but... but uh, but, yeah, how many people of science in the past 300 years have been creations? Well, all of those on whose shoulders, shoulders we stand. You know, Newton said, uh, you know, if I'm, if I'm rising above everyone else, it's because I stood on the shoulders of giants. But all those guys believe in a creator God. I shouldn't say all. That's a little too broad. But a great many of them did. The discoverers of genetics, by and large, you know, Mendel, he, he was a priest, he was a Catholic priest that discovered genetics with his research of peas and so forth. And a great many of those people who made great strides in science until very recently were God-fearing people in one way or another. They were God-fearing people. And to say, as this man has the ego and audacity to say, that you can't believe in God and do good science, is, it's just ridiculous. But there is that prevailing attitude. It's, a, it's an attitude that is held by a lot of people in science who have influential positions. We're going to talk a little bit about Stephen Hawking, who I pulled him out of the file. But he recently, like Bill and I, basically said, religion is ridiculous and nobody should waste their time with it, and we need to just move on from it. He also said that he thought his brain was basically a, a powerful computer, and that when it got shut off, that was just it. It was all over, and nothing remained. And somebody might have reminded him, we don't have any computers that somebody can make and design, and he's not open to that line of thought, sadly, unfortunately. But this story was pointed out to me yesterday, and, I, and it's, a, it's a story I like, so I'm going to give it to you instead. Scientists claims California University fired him over creationist beliefs, and they probably did. With stories like this, you can't always be sure, but uh, it, it'll get sorted out, and we'll see what happens here. But here's a guy who was hired because of advances he made in some use of the microscope uh, in examining ancient things. He, he was a, a man whose skills were highly prized. And so, the California University says it's investigating religious discrimination allegations made by a prominent scientist and former employee who claims he was fired for his creation's beliefs. Mark Armitage, scientist and evangelical Christian, claims he was fired from his job as a lab technician at California State University at Northridge because he published an academic paper which appeared to support his creationist views. Yeah, he looked at a Tyrannosaurus bone and he said this 68 million year old bone has soft tissue still intact. You can still see cellular structure here. He said, I don't think that could last 68 million years. I don't care what you're after then. And I agree with him. That's absurd, in my opinion, to think that you can have soft tissue and recognizable cellular structure after 68 million years. It just doesn't make any sense. And he said so. He said so in an article, and the article got published, and he got fired. Now, maybe there's more to the story than that. I don't know if there is or not, but he at any rate got fired, and he says it was because of his creationist beliefs. And if indeed he was, well, he wasn't the first, and he won't be the last. Well, there are other areas, I thought about talking a little bit about global warming, but I don't want to get off on the wrong idea politically there, because my opinions on that um, are my opinions on that. I, I, I believe we're in a time of global climate change, and I believe that man has a big responsibility in the climate change that's taking place here, not just because of our fooling around in nature, but our fooling around in the other kind of nature. When I read the prophets of the Old Testament, they tell me that when the culture becomes corrupt, bad things happen, and our culture has become corrupt. And I don't think fixing our ecology is nearly as important as fixing our morality 
And I don't mean in the church, I mean the world, because nations are answerable to God. And I think that there is a huge problem that the nations are refusing to come to grips with in terms of their moral responsibility before God that are going to result in all time. I, I think the, the God of Isaiah is the God of this century as well. Uh, and I see those kinds of things happening in, uh, in the prophetic text. And I, I think that the same God still rules the universe, including this little planet on which we live. And I think that consequences come when nations go their own way, that there are things that happen because of making those kinds of choices. So we have in the book of Jude, the little letter of Jude, we have Jude talking about people who have gone off after their appetites. And he says the church had people in it that were, that were doing this, that were going this way, that were doing these kinds of things. And he mentions some pretty extreme things. Jude, verses 7 and 8. He says, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, in the same way as these indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of fire. And he goes on and talks about others there. But he says Sodom and Gomorrah, because of their behavior, because of their immorality, because of their gross sexual immorality, and because of their refusal to listen to God, they went after strange flesh, they exhibited these terrible behaviors, and so God poured out judgment on them. If we went back to Genesis chapter 19, where that story is presented to us for the first time, we find that there was a guy in Sodom who didn't go along with the program. And I wonder why he was still there, because, you know, Peter says he wasn't happy there. He was, every day he was miserable in that environment. But sometimes you get yourself into something that's really hard to get out of. When Lot went there, he was a nomadic shepherd with servants and flocks. But we find him living in the city in a house. What happened to his servants and his flocks? Did he get locked into something that he didn't know how to get out of? People do. They move into a place, everything is invested in the place, and now when you want to get out, how do you get out? He didn't know how to get out. The Lord knew how to get out. Leave it all behind. Pull it. You got to go. Leave it all behind. But before that happened, when the two angels, in the story there, when the two angels came to Sodom, and they said, we're going to stay here in the public square, and Lot said, no, 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 you don't want to do that. Come to my house. And he insisted that they come to his house. And then in the, in the evening, the men of the city came around and said they wanted those men, that's all they knew, is they were men, so that they could have sexual relations with them. Lot said, don't do this, don't do this. And he tried to persuade them to do anything but that. Even the horrible extreme of taking his own daughters. And the reaction of those men was, who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Well, actually, I think they did, because he was sitting in the gate earlier in the day, which was his status. He was a wealthy man. Probably they did, because they wanted his stuff. They wanted him in their midst. But nevertheless, when he indicates that he is not happy with what they're doing, who made you a ruler and a judge over us? And this is the typical reaction that you can expect when you, by any means whatsoever, say to someone who is a scoffer, this is not a good idea. Don't do this. There are limits. There are restraints that ought to be observed. In Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 8, we're told if you reprove a scoffer, he will hate you. Reprove a scoffer and he will hate you. Scoffers are the kind of people that Peter talks about in 2 Peter, the third chapter, when he says that there will be mockers or there will be scoffers in the last days who say, everything's continued, continued as it has since the beginning of the world. Where is this coming that he was talking about? None of that stuff matters. The world just goes on as it has. The uniformitarianism is a common outlook of our day and of our times. And so we come to what I think is a premise about why these things happen in Psalm 2. Verses 2 and 3. Psalm 2, verses 2 and 3. The psalmist says, The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us tear their fetters apart and cast their courts from us. Again, in the class of John's been doing, he has had some references which said, You know, basically, we have chosen materialism, so let's interpret the data to support materialism. We have said we don't want a God, so let's find ways to support your not being a God. The psalmist says that the kings and nations say, we don't want God reigning over us. We don't want his anointed, that is the Christ, reigning over us. So let's break the fetters. Let's have freedom. Well, it isn't freedom. But let's have freedom. 
freedom from the restraints that God would put upon us. In Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 3, which I'm not going to turn and read, but Jeremiah 3 and 3, as well as in the 8th chapter, Jeremiah says, my people have a problem. They have forgotten how to blush. They don't. They have forgotten how to blush. Nothing embarrasses them anymore. And that was going to be the ruin of his nation. We had a, an old man in the church in Clare, Michigan years ago, and he would he would say, you know, I'd, I'll be sitting there. He was he was didn't have his wife living with him. He would live alone. He says, you know, sometimes I'm sitting there, I got the TV on, and they do something, they say something on TV, and I'm immediately embarrassed. I look around the room to see, oh well, nobody here but me. You know, but people don't react that way anymore. People don't get embarrassed that much of anything. They've forgotten how to blush, and that's a big problem. And so we we have the Lord saying to us because of this distinction in First John chapter three and verses twelve through fourteen. We need to figure out who we are and who we're going to be like. And we need to choose to be like the Lord and not like Cain. 1 John chapter 3, verses 12, well, I'll take 11 through 14 here. This is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of the evil one, and slew his brother. And for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. We know we've passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. We need to love the brethren. We need to support each other. We need to realize that the reaction of the world, like the reaction of Cain, they will make Cain look bad, right? Well, that's how Cain saw it. They will do anything to Cain. All they will do is what was right. He did what was right. And so he looked good. Cain didn't look good. And Cain took offense against Abel. And God spoke to him there. And when God spoke to Cain, he didn't say, Cain, you sinned. He said, Cain, sin is crouching at the door. Don't let it in. It desires to have you. You can master it. Don't let it in. We're in a culture where sin is at the door of a whole lot of people. And they have the same kind of reaction that Cain had here. If you look better than them, then you are to be resented, to be hated. Don't be surprised if the world hates you. Jesus said in Mark 13, 13, you will be hated because of my name. And the one who endures to the end will be saved. Jesus said in Luke 6, 22 through 24, blessed are you when men hate you and ostracize you and insult you and scorn your name as evil for the sake of the Son of Man. Be glad in that day and leave for joy because that's how they treated the prophets. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 9, you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death and you will be hated by all nations because of me. Jesus said in John 15, 18, If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. Jesus said in John 17, 13 through 15 in his prayer, I am coming to you now, Father, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. If you are a child of Jesus Christ, you're living in a world that is tolerant of everything except Jesus Christ. Not his teaching, not his lordship. The world doesn't like it. We're, we have a description in the sixth chapter of Revelation, no matter what the timing or indication there is. The last couple of verses of Revelation chapter six talks about how men, kings, rulers, men of authority, cry out to rocks and hills to fall on them and hide them from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the face of the Lamb. Men don't want to face God. Not here, not ever. But they will. They will face God. We all will face God. But because of a desire to slip out from under the authority of God, men hate those things that God has said. And those people who follow what God has said. You will, if you have not, you will. Someone said to me today that I was a prophet because I said something so like that, but... Uh, I'm not prophesying. The scriptures have already prophesied this. If you have not experienced hatred from the world as a disciple of Christ, you will. You will. This tolerant society is not, in my opinion, going to get better. It's not going to turn around. There may be. I, I would love to see. Believe me, I would love to see a religious revival shake this country. I would hope for it. But whether that happens or not, it's still true that greater is he that is in you than he is in the world, and the church thrived in the first century in a culture of tolerance. 
where everything except monotheism was acceptable. And the church can thrive in this age as well. We don't need the approval of the world. We need the Spirit of God. And if we put the Word of God into practice, and if we trust the Spirit of God, that God will keep His promises and give us strength, the church can flourish anywhere, anytime. Persecution has never stopped the church. And if persecution rises, it will not stop the Word. It will not stop the church. God's people will prevail. Right is on our side. We need to keep the mandate to speak His Word, to make a defense with reverence and fear, to show respect for people around us, even if they're wrong, but to realize no matter how much respect you show, they don't like the fact that they know that you don't do what they do. They know you don't agree with what they have espoused. And there will be a cross. Take up your cross. Follow Him. In John chapter 3, verses 16 through 21, we have the very well-known God so loved the world. He so loved the world. For God so loved the world. He loved the world in this way that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. So if the world hates you, you've got something better. We are in the world but not of the world. It's one of the verses that I read. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world. We're not here to condemn the world any more than Jesus was. That's not our job. That's not our mission. It's not our purpose. God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. How are they going to do that? Paul says they won't do that unless they hear, because they won't intuitively know that. They need to hear about God's one and only Son. And how will they hear unless someone preaches to them? Preachers need to be sent, but we need to share our faith, too. People need to know about God's one and only Son so they can put their faith in Him. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. I don't love darkness. And I mean that on both levels, physical and spiritual. I don't love darkness. I like to see where I'm going. I'm not that good at navigating in the light. It gets really bad in the dark. I like light. I like to see where I'm going. I like to know what's real. I like to know what's in front of me. I like to be able to glance over my shoulder and see what's behind me, too. I like to know who's with me. Light is a great thing. It's a wonderful thing. But there are people in the world who hate light. There are those who prefer darkness because it shields their activities. And there are people who prefer spiritual darkness because in ignorance they can go ahead and do what they please and not be bothered. Now, light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that they may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. Is what you're doing being done through God? We're about to sing a song of invitation. You're invited to believe and the one who came to save the world. You're invited to come into the light. You're invited to have life in His name. To turn away from the deeds of darkness. To know what love really is. You're invited to, be a ch- to become a child of God if you haven't done that before. To profess the name of Jesus as Lord and Master. The unchangeable one who doesn't shift like his, the shifting winds of the culture. You're invited to embrace Him through being buried with Him in baptism, turning away from sin, and starting a new life. If there is anyone among us who is still in the world and of the world, you need to get out. You need to start a new relationship with God that will last forever. Come forward if you need to while we stand together and sing this song of invitation. Thank you.